where I might be might not be very habitable or uh, accessible. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> That's where I'm heading now, so it's time for me to disappear back into the forest. Earthquake. One of the world's greatest disasters. Many hundreds of thousands are set to die, and why? There's not enough advance warning. But in nature, there are signals all around us. Our Earth makes sound and signals, and the animals, they can hear it. Coastline regions have sometimes only minutes to escape. And it is not enough. The Dollard system is an earthquake prediction unit. It listens into the sounds of nature and its signals, and it can tell when the earthquake is going to strike, and notify humanity up to 48 hours in advance. All around us is nature. There's signals. All men has to do is listen. Head back into the suburban wastelands. Huh? <laughs> oh yeah, well I gotta be able to, I gotta start this presentation. Um, today's the launch day for that. Mm -hmm. So I've got like several books to read and it's gonna be a big ordeal, so I can't be a distraction. All right, well I was up pretty late uh, doing the campaign videos last night, so I apologize if I'm a bit groggy. Uh, I mean, presentation books that I've seen are, are, are very thorough mathematically and uh, the last interview that you did with me recently uh, was received very well and there was actually quite a lot of serious questions from scientists concerning you know quantum uh, mechanics so I, I don't know if you want to get into that later but the, the point being is is that you're at, you're actively working on these theories and you're trying to record New, new books about these ideas and your you have a mathematical system to describe it, is that correct? Yeah, that's exactly what I'm in the process of doing basically right now as we speak, so mm -hmm. uh, that, that a lot of that relates to the last presentation so there's a very large book that's going to come out on that last presentation And that last presentation is? That was the one uh, uh, the title for the presentation was the Extra Luminal Systems of Tesla and Alex Anderson, but the title of the book is right. going to be the History, Theory, I and the Practice one. of Electrical Transmission. So that, that's got like a 396 slides in it or something. Uh, it's a massive presentation. Is that the one you're talking about? Yeah. Yeah, it right. was... Uh, it was a real son of a bitch put together. It damn near killed me. <laughs> yeah, it's it's entire. Well, now now the next one's going to be even mm. even more difficult. Mm. So because I'm getting into a whole new area here that I I haven't really you know been dealing with since very young age, involving all this music history and mm. and philosophy and number systems and all this stuff. So. I can see what starting off as a presentation is going to yeah. turn into a four or five a year study. <laughs> yeah, it's a pretty diverse subject of study, isn't it? It's like a, a theory of everything. I mean, looking at the, pre the presentation you're talking about, I was really impressed with some of the pictures of uh, the vacuum tube, you know, J.J. Thompson's vacuum tube. I mean, did he actually build that or did he have someone uh, make it for him? Well, they usually have a tube maker around. Mm -hmm. That's, you know, all the universities used to have that mm -hmm. in the old days. But gone is that, is it? The glass blower, you mm -hmm. know, makes the stuff. So mm -hmm. so that would be the case for Tesla and everybody else. Is There was, you know, some kind of glass blower, the tube guy, the guy yeah. that made the tubes. You know, Farnsworth had the same thing. In this case, it was his brother-in-law, Cliff. All right. So, I mean, that's kind of been lost, really, hasn't it? Uh, now you get kind of commercial tubes, and they're quite hard to get hold of, isn't that right? Yeah, it's, uh, it's basically everything is lost. That's going to be kind of the, <laughs> yeah. the introductory phase of my next presentation, is everything is lost, and everything's screwed up, mm. and how do we get back on the other side to try to figure out what's going on? Is this really kind of comes back to finding our way back to the mechanical analog? doesn't it? I mean, I was, I had a conversation with Dr. Green, although it's very short, about digital systems versus analog systems in terms of the producibility of sound. And I, we were talking about the limit of the digital system. It has a very finite resolution. But the analog system, you have none of that. Uh, yeah, well, the analog, the analog uh, 
signals or functions are directly outputable, you know, into making motors turn or a spot move on an oscilloscope. But a, a digital uh, signal is basically just a, a numerical interpretation. It's a description of the signal, but it's not it's a simulation. Signal. Yeah, it's kind yeah, of so, it's, yeah. So it's not really a desirable process, you know. The fact that basically everything is being digitized is uh, is not really a good uh, direction to go. No. No. So I mean, uh, there's an upcoming conference. Is that right? Coming up. What's that now? You have an upcoming conference coming up. Is that right? Yeah, it's going to be in July. I have to. That's what I'm saying. I have to start putting this presentation together. Mm -hmm. And I mean, what so is... it's going to be the presentation is mainly going to center around Pythagoras. Oh yeah, that's very interesting. So, uh, what, like perfect fifths and that kind of stuff. Because Pythagoras, there's a Pythagorean music system, isn't there? Where Pythagorean, it's all it only consists of whole whole tones or whole fractions. Well, it's basically it's the concept of ratios and proportion. Mm -hmm. So it's a geometrical type of situation that ties in very closely with my verse or algebra work. So music really is another verse or algebra system, but a very complex one. Mm. So somehow I have to be able to put this into a descriptive <laughs> form and yeah. know what I'm talking about. So uh, I'm just warming up to that right now. Yeah, so I've got four books uh, sitting in the car that when I go off into the bushes, they have to be completely absorbed, and each one has to have a, a notebook full of notes on its content. Hmm. So, I mean, uh, I've heard you speak about uh, Bach's music. I, I really do like uh, Bach's music. I like his trio sonatas most of all. But uh, you referred to complex harmonics within his work of several orders of magnitude or something thereabouts. You were saying that there was these overtones that added up in space and time depending on the way that he put his melodies together and you kind of went I remember there was a video way back uh, a few years ago now and you kind of went into that I mean are people going to expect more on this kind of subject from you oh yeah this is going to be the full bore oh wow that's great yeah. yeah so like I said it's a little premature to get you know mm -hmm. into the details of it because it's not really I don't even have a definite outline of it yet. It's just like ideas that have been floating through my head and, and notes, you know, on the the books that I'm reading so far. But there is one book in particular that started this whole thing off uh, a couple years ago. So. Oh, really? What, what book is that? Uh, it's a book called Music of the Spheres, uh, but there's several books by that same title. This one's uh, written by a guy named Jamie James. And it deals uh, with Pythagorism and and how music evolved and then devolved mm -hmm. into the pathetic state that it's in now, if you can even call it music. Mm -hmm. I mean, and it deals a lot with the uh, the numbers and the ratios, and then uh, now I'm getting into uh, the major writers on the subject, which were for the most part German. So the translations are going to be hard to find. Uh, there's a, a musicologist named uh, Jocelyn Godwin, mm -hmm. and uh, it sounds like a female name, but it's a male name. So that's the book I'm working on now, and then then I have to read a good chunk of Kepler's work. Mm -hmm. And then there's a, uh, an individual in modern times, uh, uh, Hans Kaiser, a German guy, yeah. And I have to find his books because he describes the Pythagorean and Kepler concepts in great detail. So, yeah, I mean, I've I've listened to Bach's music. It is very captivating because it's it's almost a great mystery uh, compared to listening to other music. There's more than one melody. There's kind of two. Over, well, that's the thing. Overlaid. That's the thing that's distinctive about Bach's music and. The, the music of his era and the evolution mm. to the music of that era is the process of what's called polyphony. Mm. Mm -hmm. And polyphonic music is has a direct geometrical relationship with polyphase power. So that's uh, so always that, been my interest is to connect those two 
yeah. uh, aspects. I mean, you you always hear that uh, mathematicians are often musical. I mean, it's been well known for a long time, right? Uh, I, I know a lot of mathematicians that have played the piano and, and been quite competent. Well, it used to be that, you know, mathematics and music were inseparable, so... Mm -hmm. But mathematics has kind of taken a different turn now. Just mm -hmm. like it used to be, music and science were inseparable, and they take all split off into their separate little compartments. It's the myth of Babylon, where, you know, at some point, in constructing the stairway to heaven, everybody loses the ability to communicate with the person next to them, it can because be... they become infinitely specialized. Yes, it could be summarized very well by where have, where have all the, the music piano tuners gone? <laughs> so we have a piano yeah. here and there's, there isn't a piano tuner. Finding one is really quite an art in itself. <laughs> uh, it's kind of, so what, basically it's a dying art. Nobody builds organs anymore. Nobody has an interest in concocting their own string instruments. People who do, do it digitally. There's something lost in that. I mean, that's the point, right? Uh, yeah, well, it's, you know, it's a multifaceted demise of music, you know, from coming up with goofy tonal systems to, uh, mm. you know, just romanticism was really the beginning of the end. So, so <laughs> technically, uh, the music that relates to electricity ended with Bach. Yeah. And there's a little bit of a last gasp with Mozart, but after that, it all turned into anthropocentric music. Of, you know, whining and pining and emotional deals and wars and glory and, uh, you know, yeah. until now it's just some savage barking his head off into a microphone. So, I mean, what, you, what you're saying is is that Bach's music was highly complex in its, uh, in its writing. Well, not, not was it only highly complex, but, mm. but it was the end. Mm. It was the end of music that related to the cosmos. Right. And... And music had changed so drastically since its inception from the days of Pythagoras that uh, that essentially it broke free from it to a certain extent, but uh, but nevertheless it was still orientated in that world. So even from the Pythagorean standpoint, you can be critical of Bach's music. Also, yeah. polyphony was not totally well received when it first came about. Mm. And I mean, is, isn't it true to say that uh, music that was written, say, uh, several hundred years ago, uh, is actually written normally in a different tuning system to the ones that we use now on digital instruments? Well, first of all, the bass frequencies change. So uh, the Pythagorean uh, C equals 256 cycles a second. It's been altered now, and A has been chosen as the standard. Mm -hmm. That frequency has risen, I forget, I think from 435 to 440. Yeah, 432 or 430. Yeah, something yeah. like that. Yeah. So so at any rate, uh, theoretically, it's all relative because the ratios remain the same, but there seems to be something about specific frequencies that have uh, specific capabilities. There's some kind of cosmic resonance to them. So changing the frequency... Mm -hmm. wasn't necessarily a good idea. Another complication was equal temperament. Right, the tones and the semitones and the way that they're dealt with, is that what you mean? Yeah, so you can't really get a pure consonance mm -hmm. anymore. There's always some kind of interference pattern, so the, the, the form in space of the music is no longer pure, but it wobbles, and you can't really get the harmonic alignments that would be possible with the... Uh, with the proper type of tuning that's based on you know specific just, ratios as they were developed Pythagoras, but right. then if you if you don't do that, then you can't play in all keys and you can't modulate. So you know Bach took it to the point mm. where basically you know if you put all the pieces together, you know over a period of time Bach plays in all keys. So mm. equal temperament was a must. Right. right. So it's kind of like you know one thing. Uh, you know, you lose something to get something else. So it, a lot of it depends on what are you exactly trying to do with the music. Yeah. But from the standpoint of the concept of power of music, you know, to lift rocks and do all that kind of stuff, <laughs> then uh, then those things become much more important considerations. Yeah. Right, that's very interesting. Uh, I mean, one thing I really wanted to talk about briefly was uh, the cosmic induction generator. Uh, I mean, how how is that coming along? I know you did some work and 
you had some uh, experimental evidence and data regarding that. I mean, what is the goal? Well, the, the hang-up right now is coming up with a fast, quick, and easy power amplifier to run the transformers with. So, hmm. so John Polakowski is constructing all that stuff, but like most people, he has to work, uh, so he has no time to do anything else but eat and go to sleep. Hmm. So, so progress is slow. Yeah. Uh, trying to scale it up to the giant level with these AM transmitters here is, is just uh, is way too cost prohibitive right now. Yeah. And nothing is set up for that, so so that's a, a down the line situation. But it's conceivable that by the end of the year uh, there may be something together to produce, you know, visual discharges, and what have you. But finding all these light bulbs and stuff like I used to years ago is is going to be difficult. It's not; it doesn't exist anymore. So so what I used to pull, you know, cases of out of the garbage or you know, I receive uh, truckloads from, from uh, L.A. Water and Power, you know, as far as streetlights, those are no longer available, so now even those have to be made. All right. So it's an, ex it's an expensive endeavor is what you're getting at. Yeah, it's, it's, unfortunately, it's virtually hopeless to make any progress anymore mm -hmm. because all the, the very infrastructure that supported all of this is gone. You know, I can't just uh, I just can't go off to Los Angeles, you know, and get a whole other truckload of stuff anymore. You know, I can't go back to RCA and get what I need, or the phone company, or it's not there. Yeah, there's a finite number of these parts, and it's a, it's all gone. A lot of them aren't made anymore. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah, it can't be easy to uh, put something together when you need these parts, because I mean, you have to improvise, presumably, sometimes. Yeah, it's it's the time consumption. You know, when you get to be in your 60s, you start to think about how many years you have left to live. And when you look outside your door and you see a land of utter hell <laughs> and rage, uh, and you know that's not going to last as long as you are, well, kind of, you know, you start <laughs> to think differently. So. Yeah, yeah, I mean, there's, there's definitely, I think with what you're doing with the fundraise, there's definitely a real chance for change. And at, at least, with the, the 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 seismic detection system you've got, there there is a chance where people can they'll be able to look at it and they'll be able to decide for themselves. And I mean, isn't that isn't that what the science is about? You know. Well, this is no this is not science anymore. This is engineering. Mm -hmm. So the science was done at the Landers facility. I mean, that's not to say there isn't still things to learn. Mm -hmm. You know, and that everything's been figured out. But the most uh, important thing right now is to reconstruct that particular transmission system so that it can be, you know, used as an example, mm -hmm. something that actually receives and actually works and has, you know, physical form and space. And uh, that's about as far as I can get without, you know, any major grant or anything like that is, you know, a bunch of telephone poles in the desert, yeah. you know, with... Uh, uh, repeater cabinet at the last pole. Mm. As far as, you know, putting the, the whole advanced seismic warning thing together with the chart recorders, you know, and, uh, you know, and the proper government buildings and all that, that's that's the $850,000 deal. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And so, I mean... so each, you know, increment, you know, of $30,000 or, you know, whatever, inches towards that, but but the problem in doing things incrementally is then the overhead, uh, you know, in between the increments and all that tends to eat up a lot of your money. It's not very efficient. Yeah, it's more. It's, it costs you more to do it in chunks than it. it yeah. Costs so. Ones. Right. And and like I say, you know, I can't just uh, I just can't just get all this stuff for free by the truckloads anymore. You know, I used to uh, once a month I went to the L A D W P salvage yard. And uh, my other car, which I didn't live in, I loaded up with about, you know, 400 pounds to 800 pounds of line hardware every month. Mm -hmm. And uh, they would basically just give it to me because they were interested in what I was working on. It was free. Right. Well, now that stuff doesn't even, you know, all those utility poles have been, yeah, uh, been bulldozed <laughs> and, and all, those, all that type of hardware doesn't exist anymore. Yeah. And then all these corporations, you know, and and departments have all tightened up because of all this 
UN garbage that's pressed on us here, you know, the, oh, well, you got this contamination, and you got this thing, and that thing, and, and <laughs> so it's just seized up. The whole thing's just yeah. seized up, and uh, and the people that work in the departments now are, are useless pieces of garbage, and they don't care about anything except getting home, grabbing a six-pack, and watching the game. Yeah, I mean, R, I think it's RHO or something uh, we're talking about, like an environmental thing to do with uh, certain metals used in products so uh, that killed many good piece of music uh, hardware <laughs> yeah it's really it, it's an excuse that's uh, that's utilized by this demonic uh, whatever that runs this whole operation uh, to deny us access to our own stuff yeah you know we're, we're denied access to our own public utilities we're denied access to you know the things that we paid for uh, you know that aren't needed anymore. I mean, is that, uh, that other at people could use, you know, or could be used by another country? You know, capitalism. Uh, it's a very sickening disease, yeah. and uh, and one of the premises of capitalism is when you're done with something, you have to thoroughly smash it. So there's no possibility that anybody else can make a dime off of it yeah. or use anything. So That's I mean, critical I think, the concept think, of capitalism. I think the, the the problem with the concept of capitalism is there is no upper limit. I mean, to me, that doesn't seem like a, a balanced way to go about distributing resources. But, uh, you know, now you have uh, what, 1% of the population having like 90% of the wealth. <laughs> you know, so it's something ridiculous. Uh, yeah, well, there's pros and cons with all that, too. So I don't see any shortage of money, you know, and people driving six-wheel pickup trucks around as passenger cars. That's not very cheap. No. So I don't. Got, none of these people around me seem to be living in any kind of poverty. In fact, I would say no. they have too much money. Yeah, perhaps it's what they're spending the money on rather than. Uh, well, they're spending their money, you know, on power boats and, uh, you know, and 60-inch uh, widescreen televisions and, uh, <laughs> you know, and and all kinds of stuff. But it's uh, yeah. so all it's doing is promoting savagery. Yeah, it is a sickening behavior. I mean, there has to be. A certain extent where you say to yourself well you know I don't want my kids I don't want other people's kids to grow up like this I mean this is a disease of uh, corporatism in a way because uh, the commercial system has encouraged people to live a particular uh, lifestyle and have encouraged yeah basic, basically what it does is, is, uh, is it promotes the, uh, the reproduction of the negative elements and suppresses the reproduction of the positive elements until uh, the negative elements outbreed the positive elements and then dominate, right. and then the whole thing becomes a ship with its mast dragging on the bottom and its keel <laughs> pointed at the sky. <laughs> There's no news like really bad news. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I don't see any solution to it. Well, I mean, people say that money makes the world go around, but I could have sworn it was people and their attitudes, so... Yeah, well, I built, you know, several giant installations, you know, including basically what constituted an entire Navy base, uh, you know, just on meager earnings and welfare and, uh, you know, and donations and scrap piles and whatever. Yeah, and that's not but a I can't, But I can't repeat that because yeah. that process took 20 years and it happened in a different world. Yeah, a yeah, different time for, for sure. But, I mean, you've got the pictures to prove it. I mean, nobody's questioning the fact that you've built this stuff. You built this installation at Landers, and you know the video from it is really quite amazing. I've seen some of it, and uh, you know when the whole thing is is working, when you've had it working, you can see it's not theoretical. You know. No, the theory phase was uh, way back. Everything there was the was the final output. Yeah, I mean you had the oscilloscopes connected up. You were receiving signals. The whole thing was connected. It was. I mean, how many? You must have had a huge antenna field. Uh, how many an how many antenna poles would that have been? Oh God, I don't remember, but it took about twenty five acres to hold all of it. <laughs> One antenna alone was three to four acres big. No way. Uh, the the ground rods were spread over an area of five acres. Uh, one of the antennas uh, maximum length was 1,600 feet. Right. It's several miles of wire, if not more. You know, it's kind of hard to add it all up. I don't. 
remember all the details now, but it was a slow process because I had to basically build it a piece at a time mm. and so, dig all the holes myself and, you know, and, and put up the poles with just me and my car. Just you? A lot of other difficulties, but I did get it together. Hmm. So, I mean, did you just uh, use the antenna for an antenna or did you use it for other things like uh, kind of Tesla experiments or uh, transmission line experiments or anything? kind of interesting like that. <laughs> no, this was basically an engineering uh, completion. Right. So I, mean, I took, you know, took a lot of uh, research to develop these special amplifiers and, and come up with the antenna and all that, but, hmm. but it wasn't for a general you know, purpose, experimentation, or scientific work as far as the transmission structures go. I knew exactly what I wanted. It was just a matter of optimizing the stuff and getting hmm. it to perform properly. You know, if there was uh, the the funding, uh, it would be interesting to build a giant facility to get strictly into the scientific study of all these Earth signals, you know, or another facility or the same facility to to do extensive studies, you know, on all these different wave propagations and stuff like that. But but you know, one system is not necessarily compatible with another. You can't have you know very large transmitters, mm. you know, existing in the same place as very sensitive receivers. Right, yeah. Not without a lot of difficulty. That's one difficulty <laughs> I had at Landers was was getting all this stuff to operate in a common electromagnetic environment and not, yeah. you know, get all screwed up. Yeah, interrupting. Each that other. was the most difficult part of all. Mm -hmm. That's the stuff that uh, that I practiced in the Navy. Right. In the ship, it's a very difficult situation with radars and sonars and you know and all this stuff and uh, everything wants to bleed into everything else. Yeah. Yeah. So I mean. Wow. One of the most difficult uh, aspects in uh, naval electronics engineering is so it's called electromagnetic compatibility. Right, right. Interference, in other words. Right? Yeah. Right. So I mean, uh, Tesla was going on about a, a communication system a hundred years ago that he said couldn't be interfered with. I mean, can you can you speak a little bit about what Tesla was perhaps doing? I mean, well, uh, Tesla was one to make a lot of claims, so <laughs> I can't be certain on exactly what he meant. That it was you couldn't interfere with it. Yeah. Uh, it could definitely interfere with other things, yeah. but until you know such a system is is properly constructed and completely analyzed, uh, it's it's kind of difficult to say. So, putting a, a Tesla transmitting station together is kind of an expensive endeavor. <laughs> And uh, and it has to be in a place where, you know, it doesn't wipe out everybody's computers and maggot pods and silly phones. <laughs> right. So yeah, there yeah. are places for that, but uh, that are kind of, you know, sitting idle right now. But, but all the stuff you have to go through, you know, and the money that has to be yeah. spent, uh, this, you know, to go any farther on that level... Uh, there's going to have to be some kind of major backing from, like, you know, the Navy or somebody. Yeah. And, and a lot of resources put into, in other words, Navy personnel or whatever. That's that's a situation I face. Is even if I do have a lot of money, who am I going to get to help me with these things? First of all, I can mm -hmm. trust just about everybody that said they're going to come help me has screwed me in the rear end. Yeah. And uh, and most people, you know, are all screwed up in the head, and they break things, and they do stupid stuff, and they get themselves in trouble. Yeah. So I don't know. I mean, it's uh, it's well, you make me. It's just progress. a blank. It's just the whole thing's a complete blank. So all I know is I have, you know, a certain number of people and a certain number of resources now. So with the upcoming fundraising campaign, yeah. the thing is to secure what I got. That's the first step. What little there is, so mm -hmm. I have this building. So short term so building, The building needs to be secured. Mm -hmm. uh, we're well on our way to uh, constructing this transmission system, so that needs to be completed. Physically, the the transmission structure that does the receiving needs to be completed by the end of the year. That's the aim. Right. What so it connects to, or you know, that's all uh, down the line yet. The thing is to complete it and determine. You know how it, it reacts to the ground here. That's going to be somewhat experimental because this is not really the best geological location to do this kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. 
so that's part of what's making this more expensive is we have to drill all these deep holes in this very hard rock. Right. And so that's we have to deal with that complication. Uh, there's really no way to manufacture anything here at all. Uh, you know, whatever networks or you know racks or any of that type of stuff. So. I have to, uh, because I lost all my tools at Landers, I have to buy all that stuff back again. Mm -hmm. Have you bought some of it back? Have you bought some, some things? I mean, what, what have you Well, I can't, so I can't uh, you know, everything that was looted there, scattered, lost, I, I'm not going to get anything back from that. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, some of it is, uh, is deliberately being thrown in my face, you know, the ransom deal, like with this Roy Stolte guy who stole the notebooks. Right. Right. So, at any rate, that just that serves as a, you know, a good example of what I have to go through. These are the people that, that came to help me, just like the guy that, you know, stole my identity and, you know, touts my name on the Internet in a defamation campaign. He's another person that came to help me. Well, you know, I only have one thing to say about that. Uh, now it's turned in, now he's saying that, that you've stolen $136,000 from the people, and I'm thinking, eh? You're supposed to raise the money for Eric. It's for Eric and his 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 company, his non-profit uh, laboratory. He hasn't stolen. Yeah, I, 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 I kind of missed that first first statement. What was it now that he he was saying that you'd stolen one hundred thirty-six thousand dollars from the people? I mean, that's a new one. I've not seen that claim before from him. So, I well, mean, this guy this guy <laughs> just pulls stuff out of his head. I mean, he's a he's a he's a, a, a textbook case of a pathological liar and a conniver. Unfortunately, so, people believe him, and, and that's not acceptable to me, because he was yeah, supposed to be I, doing I, what, that. What seemed, the people that seem to believe him are people of his own creation or people that put him up to this. It's been determined mm. by my associates that it's a very closed-loop situation, so mm. most of the people I'm in contact with uh, don't believe it. No. But... Uh, but at any rate, for someone that doesn't know anything about anything, it, it just, you know, it puts yeah. mud all over uh, uh, my deal. And uh, yeah, yeah. so that's, you know, the intent is... Uh, well, when he was selling is, stuff... what, what you're basically viewing is you're viewing the activities of the suppression agents. Yes. And, and, they're, and they're saying that other people are the suppression agents. Well, that's always the way it works, isn't it? Yeah, they do it very well. Uh, I think that if there were suppression agents that were real, I'd look at the ones that did it the best. Yeah, well, that's their job. The ones that made it look as, as fake and original as it possibly could. Yeah. Uh, well, you know, I won't get stuck on it, but, uh, you know, to me, my personal opinion is that's not acceptable. When someone comes out saying that they're helping you, they want to help you, they want to raise money for you, uh, I, I don't think that they can justify and say that you've stolen that money when it's clearly gone towards what you said it would be. I think that's wrong, and I think that uh, he had no problem uh, with you at all until uh, he started to realise he couldn't make money from it himself, and you know that's that's wrong. Well, actually, I've determined by analysing the whole situation that uh, it was this guy's intent from the beginning to do this. He was put up to it by others. Hmm. And in the process, with the gang of four that he assembled around himself, uh, they thought that they were going to be successful in stealing my identity and just drive me back off to the bushes in destitution and create some uh, glorious empire, uh, you know, in terms and dimensions that don't even exist for them. So it's, it's basically, you know, street life reality. These are like street people, people that I ran into, you know, in the gutter behind mm. garbage cans that just have elevated themselves because this capitalistic society allows those people to flourish and, uh, and they get all the money they want to carry out their nefarious activities. Yeah, yeah I know exactly what you mean. It's that kind of Edison way. <laughs> so at any rate, you know, ultimately it does not affect me because... Uh, you know, the bushes that I live in look the same, the car looks the same, everything's all the same. I don't see any of it. You know, I don't have any maggot pods, I have no silly phones, I have no internet, I don't have any of that stuff. I don't see any of it. It doesn't make sounds out of my shortwave radio, I don't care. <laughs> same shit, different day, huh? <laughs> yeah. So they can just swim in their own cesspool. 
you know, and attract uh, kindred turds until eventually it turns into a big mass of, you know, dead seagulls and old tires and cotexes mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. uh, and biological phlegm in the corner of some saltwater marsh. Oh, but we love that. We love that because we're not doing anything about it. And anyone who is, is obviously an environmental hippie that should be ignored. I mean, that's the kind of... This is the kind of Fox News mentality, and then that's it, right? Right? Uh, you, you turn on the TV now. Uh, I, I have seen Fox News, and I have to say the kind of things that are said are, you know, at least 50 IQ points below most people's kind of average viewing. I mean, yeah, it's, yeah, it's a whole... <laughs> without getting political about it. Yeah. You know, uh, it's uh, rampant it's savagery. <laughs> Just, you know, perhaps an intellectual argument for once on Fox News would be appreciated by some of us rather than one of these kind well, of... Well, the, the, content, the content is completely inane. Yeah. It's, it's mindlessness. The whole thing is mindlessness. Mm -hmm. So, well, at any rate, we probably should change the subject. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, well, I mean, in the meanwhile, uh, you know, you've been doing this for how many years now? Oh, well, since years. I was six years old. That would be 1958. All right, slightly more than that then. Uh, wow, so basically all of your life. Yeah, so I completed my first major installation when I was 16 years old in my parents' garage. Mm -hmm. I, wish I, I, wish I, I wish I had it today, and then, you know, yeah. that was with the help of RCA and a uh, surplus place that had a lot of Navy equipment and the phone company. Mm -hmm. I managed to, uh, to put quite a laboratory together and learn a lot of things. And uh, then after I got out of the Navy, I tried to expand that. Uh, but unfortunately, you know, when the 70s came about, that was really the day the music died. So mm -hmm. uh, even though I was going uphill, everything else was going downhill. Mm -hmm. Everyone started dying and presumably companies yeah, started closing. Yeah, so, you know, that the very... You know, institutions that spawned me were all, you know, rotting from the inside out and falling apart. Mm. And uh, society was starting to do the same thing. And, you know, it was slow at first. And so, you know, I managed to build up a pretty good size uh, installation, mostly for radio transmitting and receiving. And then the real estate realities and Diane Feinstein taking over San Francisco destroyed all that. Yeah, political change equals scientific destruction. <laughs> so, yeah, it's kind of... Yeah. So, you know, at, at one point, you know, there was all the space and facilities available to do this stuff, and then all of a sudden, you know, the, the guy that had the surplus store was forced out of business so they could build a little, you know, yuppie coffee shop and put flower pots on the street and then the entire mm. south of market of San Francisco was bulldozed mm. and then uh, so that was you know the industrial place to do the work and then uh, the, the pier I had at Fort Mason I lost that to the park service and uh, just all just vanished just within four or five years everything that I had massed mm. consisting of about 25 tons of material just all vanished to the winds Kind of like the Alexanderson system, right? I mean, uh, that was an advanced system, and it was just kind of put out of commission, and it was surpassed, supposedly surpassed. It yeah, they just, just like they the just, you know, they chopped the thing out at RCA. That was long before I got there. But <laughs> as soon as uh, as soon as uh, Marconi's, you know, electromagnetic mm. radio and short wave came about, you know, the Alexanderson system was Gone. just basically everything was ripped up and thrown over the side, you know, and the copper was all scrapped and smashed. Then the Navy uh, uh, restored, uh, restored it to some extent in World War II, and then after that, uh, you know, then anything that was left was destroyed, and it was all gone. So mm -hmm. I had to reconstruct the thing basically from the wreckage. It's you funny, know, though, when we... foundations and, you know, insulators I would dig out of the cliff and... Uh, you know, memories of uh, blueprints and stuff when I saw it when I was a child, but there was enough where I could piece back together how the thing worked, you know, and how it was laid out. Mm -hmm. And it's still a good place to do this kind of research, but unfortunately it's been taken over by the other side. All right. 
Well, I mean, what, what about your life before uh, EPD Laboratories? I mean, um, I mean, you were at Borderland Science Sciences for several years, and you put together an electrostatic, a rotary electrostatic generator with uh, Chris Carson. And, you know, that was something else. Well, that was a, that was another phase. So, you know, after mm -hmm. a, a long period of uh, not having any equipment, that's why I got into the mathematics, because I didn't have to have a lot of equipment. I could do it all with symbols. Right. So that's not what I wanted to do, but that's mm -hmm. what I ended up doing. And ultimately, I learned enough out of it to, uh, when I did get equipment again, I knew a lot more about what I was doing than when, in the RCA days, where I was more interested in just making giant sparks and explosions. <laughs> Right. <laughs> you know, for, so you grew up there. You know, <laughs> enormous radio signals, you know, that could yeah. be heard throughout the entirety of the Earth, if not on the moon at the same time. So, you know, the right, really. the, uh, the Thor uh, deal, the lightning bolts, you know, it's, which was a natural gravitation, the Tesla. Yeah. So the Borderland thing, that was, uh, you know, actually the Integratron. And uh, so. In the interim, uh, I had started, for people that had surplus Navy ships, I started rebuilding their ships for them in San Francisco and got myself into a very good position on the waterfront and was making, uh, for me, good money because my overhead was so low. Mm. Uh, good money to me is poverty to somebody else, but I was living pretty good. And that's when I started putting those uh, symbolic representation papers together because I had a you know fixed right. installation. I could work on my notes and stuff. And right. then that got me to the Integratron. And uh, then I, that's when I started to become a public figure. But uh, the same axis that uh, took the RCA facility away from me took the Integratron away from us. Mm -hmm. I mean, for those who don't know, what is the Integratron? Uh, the Integratron is a device conceived by a person named George Van Tassel, mm -hmm. which makes the claim of being an extraterrestrially derived technology. Mm -hmm. and it's a very large uh, transformer electrostatic generator that kind of looks like a spaceship. Uh, in a certain sense, you could say it would be the dome of the Wardenclyffe Tower. Hmm. So this thing uh, was supposed to build up quite an electrical field and and have a rejuvenating effect on people, according uh, to the people that put it together, Van Tassel and all that. So right. when I got there, uh, Van Tassel had died. Uh, a number of the people that worked with him were still alive, so I managed to piece together uh, what it was that needed to be done and find all the materials, and then it took about two years to analyze all that and to begin... Uh, some level of assembly, and then uh, the story of my life, all of a sudden the property's suddenly taken away from us, and everything's destroyed. And uh, this but was in Landers. You make it right. This but was in Landers, so, so yeah. at that point, uh, having moved to Southern California and developed a much more right-wing, hostile attitude than I had as a third-generation San Franciscan during the hippie era, Mm -hmm. uh, I continued to magnify that vector and moved in with a deranged World War II vet named Walt DeRoche, <laughs> uh, at which point we commenced to, uh, to build him his own military installation. That was his big dream in life. And that, uh, that involved about 30 years, 30 years of effort from the Integratron right. to the point where the same thing happened. The property was taken away from me and... and uh, you know, yeah, all but the not, legal not maneuvering the and everything went on, you know, the mm. claim that I was a squatter and none of that equipment was mine and all that. And, you know, the legal system and the cops, they just, they you just, just tell it. them to go, mm. you know, screw somebody up and they do it. They don't care. They're not, you know, they can feed them a good story and you can get the cops to kill anybody. Jesus Christ. So uh, they just, you know. And there is, there they is They kicked truth. me out and then the looters yes. came in. There is Looted the entire also. place and that was the end of that. And then... Mm -hmm. On top of that, my car was sabotaged, and I lost my dog, and and, uh, and lost the the last Navy ship that I had access to to reconstruct, and was just left yeah. to die in the bushes with, uh, you know, the, Eric's a piece of shit. That's what came out of everybody's mouth, and he, he can just go rot. Mm -hmm. That's and very then, sad. You know, and of course, you know, all this, you know, 
Harry brings it all on himself, and you know all all that 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 new age garbage. They layer on top of it. So, at any rate, the only thing to do at that point was to uh, the only thing I could do in the bushes, other than you know engage the best I could with the local utility companies to help them out mm-hmm. and trade for you know living on their right of ways, uh, was to begin to rewrite the entire theory of electricity from scratch out of the front seat of my car. Yeah. And that's a process that I'm still engaged in. It's sitting, you know, right on the table in front of me right now. It will go on as long as I'm alive. You don't give up the, easily, the, the do you? The farther I go, the more <laughs> I discover, and uh, and the more people seem to get out of it. Yeah. I mean, I, I, mean, I think you practically saved my life. I mean, uh, I was born into this education system at school, and you know, I didn't, I didn't buy the theory of the electron, and I didn't buy thermal dynamics, and I thought, well, maybe there's other things that we haven't discovered yet, and it was violently repulsed, and I, I hated that because I was a philosopher. I'd like to think of things, even if they weren't true. I'd like to think, maybe learn something from it. So, uh, you know, I commend you for continuing on against all the resistance that you've come up against. Uh, I actually spoke with Dr. Green about it, and uh, we both agreed, uh, you know, for God's sake, I don't know what Tesla would have had to gone through, but I should imagine it was something like this. Yeah, well, Tesla, you know, it didn't work out too good for him, so. No. So he has to, you know, a lot of money went into him to build this fantastic laboratory, and then it burned down, so, you Yeah, know, he was very he, upset about that. He couldn't, well, he couldn't really... Yeah. He couldn't do that all over again because it would take all that money all over again. And that's why he moved to Colorado Springs, if I recall. I mean, no, he, he went to Colorado Springs because that's the only place that he can unleash that kind of uh, electrical commotion and not right. wipe out the entire neighborhood. <laughs> yeah, I'm with you now. But that was, Colorado Springs would have been after his uh, laboratory was uh, destroyed by fire. I mean, No, I think- the Colorado Springs basically... He just walked away from it, and it's not when he was done with what he needed to do there. It was his laboratory in New York City that, that burned down before that. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. That's so what I was he, saying. So he had to start all over again, mm. which, you know, he could never recover from, mm. he really. He said that as well, yeah. He said so, that would be difficult. So he, he, he set to prove his transmission theory at Colorado, and then, then after that point, apply it. You know, with Morgan's help uh, near New York City, but then you know he kept futzing around and lollygagging and uh, and didn't get down to the the basic plan, which was to transmit a signal across the Atlantic. Mm. And then you know Einstein and Marconi and all these other distractive uh, forces come in. So by 1905, uh, Tesla was just you know a piece of garbage, just like all of his contemporaries. Once Einstein came out, that was it. J.J. Thompson and mm. Heaviside and everybody yeah. was just... Uh, they were on the scene. They were, they were they had different uh, opposing theories with each other sometimes, like uh, the Heaviside layer, uh, which I think Tesla opposed vehemently. Uh. Well, te- now, the thing you got to remember with Tesla is Tesla uh, really liked being oppositional. <laughs> So you yeah. got to kind of watch out, you know, when Tesla says something, you know, in his various articles and stuff, because Tesla is trying to be an agitator, mm. you know, and Heaviside was, was kind of similar in that regard. I mean, I mean, is he trying to be an agitator? I mean, I think, you know, most of the time he seemed quite reasonable in the things. Well, the said. thing is, is, is Tesla is, is in, in that state, Tesla is leaving out certain factors to emphasize the factors that he wants to emphasize, where, in fact, all of these various things exist. Uh, he's just working on one avenue of it, where everyone else went off with another avenue of it. I mean, but isn't that what EM and relativistic uh, physicists do anyway? They kind of they know that there are certain problems surrounding an idea, but they kind of they march on regardless <laughs> with the assumptions that they've got, and they try and prove them and confirm them and predict new things. Well, basically, basically, what all of the, those theories have done is, is have uh, moved us from fact to fantasy. Yeah, so maybe that's why Tesla was so kind of, uh, 
opposing because he kind of knew where he's going, you know. Well, there this. was actually widespread opposition at the time. It almost oh. led to riots. <laughs> really? So these things are left out of the history books of uh, these massive upheavals that occurred, you know, during Tesla's heydays, you know, of riots mm. and, uh, you know, and, and, oh, it's pretty bad, man. Labor deals and all this politicals, racials, all these conflicts, you know, were yeah. Yeah. because... Uh, when they tried to shove this whole corporate capitalistic reality down the living organism's throat, uh, that organism uh, wasn't really too happy about it and fought back, you know, the organism yeah. being the general human species. But, you know, through giant wars of readjustment and massive levels of propaganda, yeah. uh, the human species has been annealed into this uh, livestock servitude. Well, I mean, try and explain negative growth to a, a living organism. <laughs> That's going to take you at least 10 years. <laughs> so at any rate, it, it all went down together with Tesla. So, yeah. you know, but the, the world that Tesla came from, all these people had different theories. But, you know, you read through Heaviside's writings and Thompson's writings and other people. Is, uh, is their theories aren't necessarily oppositional, they're comparative. Mm. And they all really, at one level or another, were working together. And, and all of their findings were based on experiment and, uh, and had, you know, a background of classical philosophy involved. It kept everything, you know, in the direction that it was going. And then modernism, you know, and nihilism and all this type of stuff uh, just mm -hmm. likes to destroy things and make things all complicated and goofy and screwed up. And that's what we got now. Mm -hmm. I mean... I mean, would you say that Tesla was in many ways a little bit before his time? Because, you know... Oh, no, Tesla was, was very much a part of his time. Yeah? I mean, when I say that, before his time, I'm talking about his claims of eliminating distance resistance and other things that sound kind of quantum mechanical. Because that didn't exist yet. And he was talking yeah, about... Yeah, well, he was being prophetic. Than yeah, but yeah. then everybody kind of was. Because they were getting all excited by their discoveries, so uh, these guys were ahead of their time in the fact, uh, you know, there was no really concrete system of units to express uh, electrical quantities, and and you know, certain mathematics mm. hadn't been fully developed, and yeah, that's all symbolisms, you, just, uh, you know, a concrete symbolism had not been established yet. You know, that stuff started to come about with with uh, Kennelly and Steinmetz. Right. Kennelly and Steinmetz took all this uh, confusion, you know, obtruse equations and uh, and confusing variables that you can't distinguish between one or another, and no dimensions and uh, mm -hmm. no specific applications, and converted into concrete electrical engineering. Right. You know, heavy side stuff was was so far out and so complex that you know even though it's fantastic and the possibilities are fantastic is is no one's really going to get it right. somebody you know like Kennelly had to come along and okay well let's take this piece here of what we got and uh and bring it down to earth and you're, you're are you referring to quaternions to what to, to uh, well Quart heaviside did not use quaternions he despised right. them to the point that he told parables about <laughs> disgust for the matter uh, Heaviside developed his own right. form of vector calculus, which is widely used today under the, uh, the erroneous name of Maxwell's equations. It's not Maxwell's equations, it's Heaviside's equations. Mm -hmm. And people have become fixated on that, but other ideas of Heaviside, like faster-than-light electrons and all that, are uh, you know completely shunned. So the best thing to do is just erase Heaviside's name out of the history book, put somebody else's name in the place, and call his equation somebody else's name and forget about him, and that's what's been done with Heaviside. Right. But right. you can spend three lifetimes studying his work. But right. then his work is very one-sided because it only deals with transverse electromagnetic relationships and completely ignores all the other stuff. Right. So it's not necessarily a place to spend a lot of your energy unless you want to just get into that one-sidedness of things. I mean, Unfortunately, uh, there wasn't another heavy side uh, to carry on, you know, the direction that Helmholtz and Tesla and those people were going. I mean, are you familiar with the, because I mean, at Copenhagen, uh, Einstein was defeated really quite badly, and uh, something called the Copenhagen 
Copenhagen interpretation of quantum physics was created? Yeah, somebody, uh, th my friend in Lone Pine that gives me all these books uh, mm. to read, he reads them, then he gives them to me, and then we talk about them. He, he uh, loaned me some book on on quantum goofiness, and uh, I remember that name being associated with something completely absurd. Mm. <laughs> so the whole thing uh, struck me as absurd. Right. And, I mean, uh, so I, I don't even, I just ignore all of it. Right. It, it has no meaning to me. Right. Just so ignore no, it. So no kind of integrational equations or anything like that for calculating paths of uh, conductivity, you don't subscribe to the quantum system of path addition? Well, I know that there's the, the whole quantum concept of the Faraday tube and J.J. Thompson, that, that all of, you know, this so-called quantum stuff originated out of, but that I stay with Thompson. I don't go any farther than that other than my own, you know, mathematical developments out of it. Right. Uh, but that's everything I need is right there. I don't need the rest. These other people don't provide me anything useful. Mm -hmm. See, I can't calculate the resistance of a transmission line with their mm -hmm. uh, materials. I don't know how many times I push, you mm -hmm. know, these physicists that have PhDs, <laughs> why don't you solve this mathematical problem for me? It should be very easy for you. It's difficult for me because I don't have that level of experience or knowledge, but you're right. the PhD physicist. You should be able to do this in one afternoon and give me the answer I want. They can't what do is it. Their answer? They can't. They don't know the answer. Or they they can't. They're it. not. Uh, they're so off into the abstract. There's no way that they can take it down to a simple situation. You know, of how much force pushes on the wires mm. on the on the telephone pole when there's a certain amount of power flowing through it. It's basic stuff. Yeah. You know, that they they, they kind of know it for the magnetism. They can they can get that low, but they can't get it for the electric field in general because mm. the physicists have erased the electric field. And they've, they've erased, erased the, and they've erased the uh, the dielectric component of it, and said right. that these things don't exist. So it's now they have this completely lopsided patchwork of uh, of mathematics and what have you uh, to make up for this asymmetry, mm. which provides nothing useful to the practicing electrical engineer. So did you say asymmetry? Asymmetry. Yeah. yeah cause, cause I mean, the, I it's so it's so what it is. I call it the one wing parrot. I wrote a little thing about that, you know, in my early Lone Pine writings. You know, the uh, the giant uh, idol was a big, hundred foot high statue of a parrot with one wing, and it was made out of plutonium. <laughs> and uh, the the multitudes were awed by it, you know, and bowed yeah. down to this thing. But unfortunately, it burned their eyes and made them blind from the fire that was radiating off of it. So they. Wandered blind in the wilderness forever. Well, that's that's a very colourful metaphor. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, another question for you. I mean, you might not you might not be. Uh, are you familiar, or can you talk about the the Bell inequality tests, which were inconsistent with relativity and causality? Uh, I don't. I, see, I don't subscribe to any of that stuff. I I can talk to you about you know lines of force, uh -huh. and uh, you know amperes per square centimeter you know, and all that kind of stuff, mm -hmm. but I don't subscribe to that other stuff. It's not part of my world. It doesn't exist. So, for instance, accounting for the collapse of the state vector without subjective collapse triggers, that just, that's uh, whatever. not Whatever, I enough. don't know. Maybe you know, I can find somebody <laughs> all high on meth outside, maybe they can give me a better idea of what's going on. <laughs> Listen to them yather for two hours. So you, now I'm scared I think it would be more interesting than <laughs> trying to figure out this convoluted Einsteinism. And it's insanity. Mm. Mm. Well, I mean, I mean, I'm so into quantum mechanics because it is, in a sense, an anti-relativity, and it it did really, from what I understand, what I've read, really drive Einstein quite mad because he wanted, he called it spooky action at a distance, this instantaneous uh, entanglement, and he really had a problem with it. Well, what, anyway, they read. they can all screw themselves. <laughs> so, I wasn't born yet. Right. I'm a creature of the 18th century. Mm. Mm. Okay, well maybe uh, maybe another question for you that might be more into... Um, okay, I'm going to ask you this question. You might not like it, but I'll ask you. 
Uh, specifically, are you familiar with Kramer's transactional interpretation of quantum mechanics, where there are what's known as advanced waves, corresponding to the negative time solutions of EM wave equations? No, no, they're not. Uh, that wasn't. Uh, they didn't know about that in 1738. Right. All right, all right, I see what you're saying. So you, yep. you, you take a classical approach. No, it says uh, the gate. The gate closes at, at one nine zero zero. <laughs> really? That's Is it. that bad? That's the wall. Right, and and this is really the, the the ongoing difference between what what you would describe as what electricians and physicists or engineers and scientists. Well, the thing is, these people. Th you know, they referred to themselves as electricians. That didn't mean that they put in house wiring, because that hadn't right. even been invented yet. Yeah. But electricity used to be its own science. You have, like, the science of, of electricity. You have the science of optics. You have the science of physical forces, which is physics. You have, like, biology. You have astronomy. Uh, but the science of electricity was basically kidnapped and murdered by the physicists. Hmm. So there right. is no more science of electricity. Uh, um, and the science of optics got, you know, swallowed up. And basically physics has swallowed up everything and think, you know, that they know the secrets to the universe. And, uh, and that's that. Hmm. Right. So, I mean, it just comes so back. People, people like J.J. Thompson and, and Oliver Heaviside and Nikola Tesla... Uh, those were all people they called those people tend to call they tend to call them electricians and then after 1900 they basically all just evaporated right and that that's that's mainly due to what Einstein and relativity and the well opposing. it's a whole social you know it's, you can't really blame it on one individual mm -hmm. these other you know Einsteins and the rest of them just basically rode the wave of their time, which mm. was to turn everything into a massive confusion and dismay. Mm. Well, I mean, every present civilization, no matter what great invention or method they can cox, always comes to some sort of sticky, unhappy end, right? You know, there's there's going to be some sort of thing that's been missed, like Thompson, he missed that that they weren't corpuscles. Uh, apparently they're not, according to Rutherford, and that was kind of, um, you know, the scientific theory had to be updated, and, and that's, if you look at the, the present theory, there's always a resistance to new ideas, but ultimately the, the, old, the old ideas are revised eventually, right? And in a sense, that's, that's what you're trying to do with uh, the applications of the Tesla technology by showing it. Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to put things in terms of, of engineering, mm -hmm. not theories. 